Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us at this session today. Um, Amy and I are going to be talking to you about a project that we've been working on for just over a year now to develop a new competency framework and associated resources for digital preservation. Um, so apologies for the uh, title of the paper. I always have to have an old school soul or R&B song as my uh, conference or blog titles. So we're here for Ain't No Mountain High Enough for developing a new competency framework for digital preservation. Um, so some background to the project. Um, it's no surprise that um, someone whose job title is Head of Workforce Development will claim that skilled staff are essential to digital preservation. But it is an observation that's been shared by many others as well. Nearly 20 years ago now, in their seminal 2003 essay, The Five Organisational Stages of Digital Preservation, Anne Kenny and Nancy McGovern championed a balanced approach to digital preservation where skilled personnel with defined responsibilities were key components. There's been much work in the intervening years on workforce development issues of digital preservation, which has highlighted that it is an interdisciplinary undertaking requiring competencies that include those specific to digital preservation domain, as well as technical project management and many other genetic soft skills as well. And this has been borne out in curricula such as DIGIN, the DigC Curve Matrix and the DigCurve Framework. Analysis of the staffing and development issues faced have also uncovered challenges relating to training, recruitment, workloads and other issues such as in Blumenthal and um, co-authors 2020 article, What's Wrong with Digital Stewardship? Um, and we'll hear about some more recent research in the panel coming up next um, on the, research, the recent research done as part of the NDSA staffing survey. So that was kind of the background of um, kind of where we were coming from and where we were in digital preservation in terms of competencies before we started this project. But why did we decide that we needed to develop a new framework? Well, at the DPC, we're all about community and we're all about hearing what our members need. And the practitioners that we work with told us that they needed help in workforce development in a number of different ways. They needed help with identifying skills gaps, with structuring their professional development, in making the case for more staff, and that's a theme that we'll hear very strongly coming through in the next uh, panel session. Um, in developing role descriptions and then also in managing and facilitating recruitment. So our key aims for this project have really been about making sure that the competency framework encompasses current good practice. Um, and any of you that were with us yesterday morning, the difference between good and pra uh, best practice is something that's very important to us at the DPC. Um, and so good practice is always what we would say because you should do what is right for your organization and what is good for your organization and not trying to, a fool's errand to try and reach a, perhaps a best practice standards that may never be achievable. We also wanted to make sure that it was flexible enough to deploy for a variety of purposes and also that it was closely linked to our maturity model, the DPC's rapid assessment model, or RAM. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Amy now, who's going to take you a little bit through our methodology for the project and the pilot that we ran. Uh, we wanted to have a methodology that reflected those aims. We wanted to draw from existing work and we wanted to really draw from the expertise and experience of those who are working in digital preservation uh, on a practical level as well. So we broke it down into three main phases uh, which are presented here. We really want it to be uh, team-based and iterative and agile. In short, we wanted it to be something where there were different stages of us uh, working on the framework, reframing the framework, getting feedback from colleagues and from members of the digital preservation community. So here's an outline of those three phases. The first one was uh, gathering a uh, reading list with some of those resources Sharon just mentioned, as well as others. We ended up with, I think, about 20 on that final reading list. And then Sharon and I each individually went through those, did our own kind of qualitative analysis where we looked for direct or indirect references to digital preservation related skills and competencies. Then we made our own conclusions, met face to face in August and just basically went through each of those to compare our findings and have a preliminary list of identifiable skills or competencies based on that. 
So phase two was, uh, it actually started during that same face-to-face -face meeting. We had, uh, you can see the illustration here, we had the first of a series of mapping exercises. Uh, and this was for us to actually help structure the framework and think about the broader competency areas for each of the skills. So this is post-its, lots and lots of post-it notes. We wrote each of those items on a pre that were on that preliminary list, moved them, removed them, made sure to put them in a spreadsheet so we didn't forget them, and then went back, put it on, on an online whiteboard. Miro uh, was the one that we used, and kept on doing the restructuring and discussion over a period of time. And I just really want to reflect on how uh, we felt the mapping exercises were really, really useful, not just for structuring the framework in those early stages of design, uh, and they helped us look at those areas where there are overlaps and interrelationships, but also provided a way for us to structure and present early drafts uh, to colleagues and to others in a meaningful way leading to phase three. So this might be the most important because it was getting uh, that, that feedback and refining and making sure uh, that it covered enough scope and was flexible enough to be um, widely applied, but also having enough detail to be usable. So we did a bunch of series of those. The first one we originally had from the post-it note exercise, I think 37 elements, then it went up to 74. Then we shared it with DPC colleagues to scale it back down to a reasonable level. Uh, and then that is the one that was uh, in the paper for IPRES, but since then we have done different uh, versions of it and iterations. And getting into things that were helpful, we also, uh, Sharon will get into, we created a complementary resource, uh, which was the DPC Competency Audit Toolkit, and we conducted a pilot with DPC members for them to work through an audit using the framework and the toolkit. Uh, and this was really helpful, especially in terms of thinking about ease of use and how the process went. So here's a quick structure. It, was, uh, it went over about two months. We had an introductory session, did a walkthrough of CAT, thought about questions and planning for the audit. Uh, we asked participants to complete the audit process. Uh, the majority did, uh, but again, we found that different organizations, especially at a larger scale, might need more time depending on participation of those involved in the audit. Uh, and then ongoing support throughout and then gathering feedback. So from that feedback, uh, we wanted open and honest feedback, so we let participants know. We wouldn't share any identifiable information about them, but they're welcome to share this on their own. But suffice it to say, uh, no two were the same. Uh, the five were in different geographic locations. They were diverse in terms of different organizational types, and also in terms of the number of staff participating. There was uh, one with one person who was working in digital preservation for the org, and then it went up to 11. So, um, went up to 11, that's good. <laughs> uh, so the main area of feed feedback were, uh, again, Sharon will go more into detail about what the framework is, but it was really useful uh, we originally had the framework and the audit toolkits, and there was a need for better linking and incorporating the two into the one toolkit. Uh, clarifying differences when talking about digital preservation specific versus more non-digital uh, preservation uh, generic skills. Uh, just clarifying how all of them are part of making successful digital preservation, but of course no one is meant to have all of the skills across all the areas. And then the need for having a simple, short, easy guide for different scenarios, which is just commenced and we're hoping to get that done soon over the next couple of months. And then, of course, positive feedback is always nice to share, um, but it was great to see comments affirming the relevance, uh, making the tacit aspects more articulated, uh, that it does show that broader range of skills and how multifaceted it is, um, and that iterative is good. Uh, we are aware that this is not a one-off. This is something that changes with digital preservation. So it's something where the more that it comes into the use, the more we're gonna hear from the users and the more of a better resource um, and company resources that we will have. With that in mind, just quick progress to date. Here's kind of a checklist of what we've done so far. Uh, the competency framework, uh, the CAT, which um, recognized the help we received in the CAT from the UK's uh, NDA. 
We also created example role descriptions. So these are kind of applying the different skill levels to different types of roles that you might find. And then we had a member preview release and pilot around the same time last summer. And you can mark your calendars. We're going to make it formal. The full public release is planned for the 19th of October. So I'll hand it over to Sharon back to have more details about CAT. Yeah. While the full public release and the kind of the hurrah and the event will be the 19th of October, we have now made all the resources, um, kind of taken away the password protection on the DPC website, so you can access them. We just won't be promoting it quite yet because obviously iPress, so we need to wait till after that. Um, but to give you now a quick overview of the actual structure of the competency framework, which Amy's alluded to a little bit already. Um, so the competency framework itself defines five high-level competency areas, uh, which look to define the kind of main competency areas involved in working in digital preservation. Um, and within the framework, it offers an overview of and quick reference to these broad range of competencies um, that are included. Um, below the competency areas, we have organised um, 28 skill elements. So as Amy said, we're keen on feedback, we're incorporating that as we get it. So the original version that went out for member preview had 27, and the new version has 28. So that's the kind of updates that we're making already. Um, and then um, we kind of break, down, they really are about breaking down the competency areas into kind of more clearly defined units where you can actually kind of really see how that skill would be implemented. And we have kind of supporting statements against each of those so you can see how they might be described in a role description. And so to give you a quick look at uh, the uh, competency areas and skill elements, I'm obviously not going to go through all of these today, uh, but you can see um, straight away how again uh, the digital preservation is a multidisciplinary undertaking so we have competency area around governance resourcing and management includes things like policy development and risk management we have competence around advocacy and communication i don't think there's anybody that works in digital preservation who doesn't understand the burden sometimes that communication and advocacy is for us uh, we've got the technological skills there. Um, one of the things we wanted to make sure that was really strong here as well is around legal and social responsibilities. So bringing in key elements around particularly environmental responsibilities um, and inclusion and diversity. And then finally, the kind of digital preservation domain specific um, knowledge, skills and competence that are required. So please do download the competency framework and have a look at this in more detail. And so for each of these um, 28 skill elements, um, you can grade yourself against five different skill levels. And we see this uh, hopefully as a, a progress of development about your knowledge and competency and skills in particular areas. So they go through a novice level, through beginner, intermediate, and advanced and expert. So at a novice level, we're thinking it's somebody who has an awareness of the topic. At a beginner, you might have had some training, but no practical experience yet. Intermediate, you've got some practical experience but haven't maybe done too much. Advanced, you're comfortable with applying this particular skill in a practical situation. An expert, we're really looking at people there who are kind of leaders in the field who lead research and innovation within this kind of particular skill area. And like the DPC RAM model, we don't expect anybody to be aiming for expert level in all 28 of these skills. Um, and nor, I have to say, do we expect any one person to be competent in all um, 28 skill areas. Again, digital preservation is a collaborative undertaking. So we expect whoever you have working in digital preservation, your team, your department, um, it might be people who are quite diverse across your organisation, together you would be expected to have the competencies needed across these 28 um, skill elements. Um, and for each of these um, skill levels, we have also included what we've called activity um, descriptors, which is really about kind of using, kind of giving you some verbs as the type that you might include in a, a role description to kind of understand what these skill levels are. We did think about getting really into kind of more detail for each of the skill elements about describing um, for each of the five levels what it might be for that skill element. But it's, again, digital preservation is so context specific that it was becoming too prescriptive and we really didn't want that. So that's why we've tried to make it as flexible as possible. The accompanying resources that Amy has alluded to already, we have um, the Competency Audit Toolkit or DPC-CAT. 
um, which was really about providing a practical structured process for assessing competencies in digital preservation. This was one of the key things that we really wanted to achieve out of this project, was not only to develop a competency framework that kind of provided the kind of theory, but also have a practical way that it could be used by the digital preservation community to assess competencies in a structured way. And that toolkit includes three elements, an actual guide to the competency audit process, um, and then two workbooks. One focusing on auditing individual um, skills and role descriptions, and another one focusing on um, doing an organisational audit where you can bring together the results from individual um, audits with RAM scores to get an idea of where your skills are in um, digital preservation and compare it to your kind of capacity for doing digital preservation work. As Amy said, we also have um, the eight role descriptions to go alongside it. Again, we don't want these to be prescriptive. They're rather examples of how you might construct a role description from the um, competency framework for people working at different levels. So they have those at the beginning of their career. So we have a role description for a graduate and a trainee. We have those who are more like a practitioner focused, perhaps. So a digital preservation officer, a digital archivist or librarian, a web archivist and a digital preservation developer. And then also in a more senior role. So a, perhaps a digital preservation program manager or a senior executive or administrator. So to give you some use cases, just to get you an idea of how we um, would see this being used, um, and these are some of the use cases have actually come out of the pilot already. So for practitioners, we could see them using the competency framework and CATS to help assess their own current skills and to plan their continuing professional development. Um, it might also help them to make the case for a promotion or increased compensation, because I don't think anybody thinks they're getting paid enough. So with that out there. Um, for managers, um, we would see it's potentially helping you to structure staff, staff appraisals. So if you have staff members working in digital preservation and you want to do a review of their current skill levels and how you might help them kind of upskill, then the competency framework is going to give you a way to do that. Um, also, again, it's going to give you um, kind of structured kind of data and information about how you might make the case um, for um, digital preservation, um, including your staffing allowance. For organisations, it's going to help with the identification of skill gaps within your digital preservation staff. And um, so seeing, we'll, uh, it's again a link to RAM, where are we in terms of our capacity and then how um, we can um, identify the gaps that we have in terms of the skills we need to support that. Um, and also to facilitate recruitment. So if you're having to write a job description and you're not sure where to start, hopefully the competency framework and the job description is role descriptions in particular, will help you with that. And then finally, for educators, we'll hope it will be a good resource for helping them to plan curricula for digital preservation education and also to help them ex assess existing course content. So just to finish up, um, we are planning to continue to expand the resources. This is going to be a, um, a resource that the DPC will continue to support and review over time and expand the resources to go along with it. Amy's already mentioned the quick start guides that we're looking to develop probably around those kind of use cases that I've just mentioned. So you want to um, do a review as part of a staff appraisal. Here's a quick start guide on how to use CAT and the competency framework for that. Um, we're going to hopefully develop more resources to help support recruitment for digital preservation roles and um, to provide guidance for people on how to upskill. Um, so if you have uh, realised that you're at a beginner level in terms of policy development, what training um, or kind of professional development resources out there that will help you move up to an intermediate level. Um, Amy is going to be starting later this year on another round of our labour market analysis, so capturing more data about what the actual labour market is like at the moment in digital preservation, um, which again will hopefully feed into this process. And um, hopefully a lot of you will have heard of our Novice to Know How online training course and our plan is to develop, um, starting later this year, more online training content. Um, which will be motivated by the kind of areas covered by the competency framework and um, lead on from that beginner level training. So that's really everything we wanted to cover today. I'm getting the thumbs up that we've been on time, first time in my life I have ever managed a presentation on time. So I think now we'll welcome any questions that you want to ask. Um, 
just a few quick sort of ground rules for the Q&As. We have very helpful volunteers who are floating around with a microphone. So if anyone has a question here, please do raise your hand and a volunteer will pass you a microphone. Um, and could, if you could just say your name and institution um, ahead of your question, that would be grand. And also, please don't forget that Slido is available if you don't want to uh, ask a voice question. Please do use Slido and Sarah will facilitate those. Um, but I think we have our first question. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Melinda Haunton at the UK National Archives. Um, thanks ever so much for that. It was really interesting. Um, Amy, you mentioned briefly that, um, or you know, Sharon can answer this too, <laughs> um, that you'd added one competency into the framework as a result of feedback. And I was really interested both in what was that, um, but also the kind of, ha what kind of feedback have you been getting? Because as you said, digital preservation is incredibly um, context specific and you were, you were trying to avoid being too, too narrow, I guess. But do you get the feeling that you've pitched it right so far? Definitely, that's kind of the feedback we've been getting has been very positive and that we feel that they've pitched it right. Um, I'll address the additional framework and then I'll pass over to Amy for the feedback because she knows a lot more about that. Um, so the additional element that we added was within the information technology section. So originally we had um, programming skills just folded into the general IT um, but the more we got out and talked to people and the kind of importance of those skills growing in digital preservation, we felt that did deserve to be a skill element on its own. So that, that's now been pulled out as an additional one. Uh, but over to Amy for the feedback stuff. Yeah, uh, so when we asked for feedback, we asked kind of firstly how the progress went because it was important to see about the ease of use of actually using the guide um, and the toolkit as well as things that they thought were were relevant or perhaps problematic or challenging. Um, all just very general overall positive uh, feedback in terms of the process. Uh, if, in terms of that, there is the need for kind of the shorter guides because again, it's context specific. So as we find certain scenarios, it'll be easier to do that. Um, in terms of other things, I mean things that would naturally kind of come up with um, clarification of meaning of terms sometimes, like stakeholders and users, that's something that I think really varies in different contexts. So um, just kind of reaffirming that it's like RAM, it's for you to look at and interpret in your way and set it up at the start and use it in that way. But also, you know, if that's something that comes up again, I think we've talked about maybe doing a glossary of terms for clarification of meanings and stuff. But yeah, overall really positive, which is great. <laughs> yeah. It's quite scary when you put something like this out into the world. So we were quite pleased that the, the, the um, feedback was mostly positive. Uh, any further questions from the floor? Uh, a question from Helena Byrne at the British Library. Uh, looking forward to reading the toolkit, how transferable do you think this framework is to applying to discipline-specific fields such as web archiving? We have tried to make it as flexible as possible for that, and that's one of the reasons why we particularly wanted to make a role description for web archi archivist, so that we could show that it could be a a applied to that. So it's basically, we found that um, in developing that role description, it was often the case of um, switching the, the word digital preservation for web archiving was enough. Uh, there was a few bits where we would, you would need to reference specific um, web archiving kind of processes, but um, so far we have found that it is uh, flexible enough to be able to apply for kind of more specialized preservation roles like web archiving. Great, in that case, I think we'll wrap up and say thank you again to Sharon and Amy. Um, and up next, sorry, yep. <laughs>